Premier Zelensky's virtual address to the Shangri-La Dialogue and why the war in Ukraine is important to the Indo-Pacific region. Let's listen in. The Shangri-La Dialogue has been exceptional. We had one obvious standout event, which was the address by President Zelensky to the Dialogue, which he delivered by VTC from an undisclosed secure location in Ukraine. And the reason was not just because he is the person who carries probably the burden of the free world at the moment, but also because he spoke in clear terms about why what is happening in Ukraine matters to this region. So he was able to root the discussions and considerations of this region in the really uncomfortable reality of a war in Europe where a small, free, sovereign country has been invaded by an aggressor, very much larger than itself, and acting in defiance of the international order. So that was a very special occasion for the dialogue and a really clear reminder of the interconnectedness of what is happening in the Eurasian, in the European theater, and what is happening here in the Indo-Pacific. In an update on the war in Ukraine, U.S. President Joe Biden just announced $1 billion worth of new arms for Ukraine as Pentagon officials defended the pace and quality of supplies as meeting Kiev's battlefield needs. The newest U.S. arms package features 18 more 155-millimeter Hovitzers and 36 rounds, 36,000 rounds of ammunition for them, two land-based Harpoon anti-ship missile systems, and additional rockets for four HIMARS precision rocket artillery systems that Ukraine is soon to put in the field. President Biden said that he told Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky in a phone call on Wednesday that the U.S. will stand by Ukraine as it defends its democracy and supports its sovereignty and territorial integrity in the face of unprovoked Russian aggression. Now, the Asia-Pacific shares security challenges with other regions. The ongoing war in Ukraine has underlined a number of challenges it faces in common with Europe in particular, from the management of regional security flashpoints to the maintenance of a rules-based order. Recent events have raised tensions about plans by European nations to play a greater role in the Asia-Pacific security. Take a look. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in interesting times, and that is meant as ironically as it sounded. I'm also glad that the IIIS asked us to speak about common challenges for Asia-Pacific and European defense, because that is indeed the right framing. Europe and Asia have a shared stake in each other's security. Putin's territorial war shows how our continents are connected. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a global challenge with global ramifications. And these ramifications bring global responsibilities. Neutrality is not possible. Furthermore, Europe is drawing lessons from the war against Ukraine. This makes European countries and the EU better partners for Asia too. There is no far away. A war in one part of the world affects people across the globe. The war in Ukraine has already affected all of us, also people far beyond the European continent. From scarce energy supplies and rising prices to bare shelves in our supermarkets. And if we fail to secure the export of Ukraine's grain and its harvest that's coming on. The entire world will have to face grave consequences as a food crisis looms. The whole world risks stagflation, global security, and the global economy are at risk. And all because of Putin's war, the demolition of Ukraine's critical infrastructure, including grain silos, the blockade of Odessa. It's all due to the war, not to our sanctions. 
Development in the Indo-Pacific region also has growing impact on our global prosperity and collective security. As the oceans are the arteries of the global economy, the Indo-Pacific region is crucial in this regard. The seas need to be freely accessible to all, and that requires action by all of us collectively to uphold rule-based international order. We have begun to look beyond our own region, and we're ready to face the reality that regional threat landscapes are increasingly connected across borders, across continents. A paradigm shift has taken place towards recognizing global threats using a 360 degrees approach. Threats countries in Asia have been facing more consciously. Your experience can thus provide us with valuable lessons also in Europe, because we are indeed drawing lessons. Putin has brought us together as never before. European countries have stepped up their game to provide security against present and future threats. And his actions have woken up the EU to its geopolitical role and the importance of defence cooperation. Meanwhile, Russia's UN Ambassador Vasily Vasily Nebenzia briefed reporters on the Russia-Ukraine conflict and he blasted a double standard approach of the Western media on the war. Take a look. On the recent developments, uh, you know that the Ukrainian military continued to shell civilians. Uh, recently, their assaults have intensified. In fact, they never stopped those assaults. And on June 13th, the Kyiv regime launched a large-scale shelling of the city of Donetsk and adjacent areas in the Donetsk People's Republic. The Ukrainian military fired around 350 rockets and artillery rounds. This uh, shelling claimed lives of six civilians, including a, chi including a child. More than 30 people were injured, and altogether, since the start of the special military operation, more than 100, 100 civilians died in the, in the territory of Donetsk and Lugansk uh, republics. This shelling could not bring to Kyiv any military advantage, as Donetsk is not on the line of contact. There are no military objects where the shell, shells fell. The Ukrainian military deliberately targeted civil, civilian districts and infrastructure, hospitals, markets, residential areas. It was nothing else but a cold-blooded revenge against those most vulnerable, the ordinary people of Donbas. The mapping of targets clearly shows that the aim of the Kyiv regime was to inflict as many civilian casualties as possible. One of such targets was the Vishnevsky Maternity Hospital. The building was damaged, the staff and the patients, pregnant women, were forced to evacuate to the basement. Three newborns in the intensive care unit could not be evacuated, and along with three doctors had to stay on the upper floors, which put their lives at huge risk. Fortunately, this time there were, there were no casualties, but you can only imagine despair and fear of these women and medical staff of the hospital uh, they, they had to endure. Uh, it is a disgrace that the Western media largely stay blind, deaf and numb to these appalling incidents. And those who speak up only to do so, uh, only do so to promote nonsense that the city was shelled by the Russian forces. This is a clear illustration of the double standard approach of the Western media. Zelensky hypocritically claims that Kyiv is not interested in shelling of civilians, but facts prove him wrong. The trajectory of the, of the rockets shows that they were fired from the territory under the control of the Kyiv regime. And uh, these are exactly those types of weaponry supplied to Kyiv by its Western sponsors. And now this Western artillery is killing innocent people. I would like to say to the Western countries supplying weaponry to Ukraine, the blood of civilians is on your hands. The tragedy in Donetsk confirms once again that you are fighting a proxy war with Russia with the hands of Ukrainians till the last Ukrainian. Thank you.
In the related news at the Austrian World Summit Climate Conference, Arnold Schwarzenegger denounced Europe for financing the war in Ukraine by paying Russia for fuel, saying, we have blood on our hands. Take a look. Paint. The figures remain, I think it's, it's worth repeating them because they are staggering. 89 million is the figure correct in the report related to 21 but even without ukraine we were already on a very high figure unfortunately higher than the previous russia's war in ukraine has pushed global displacement numbers above 100 million for the first time and the u.n warns the resulting hunger crisis could force many more to flee their homes take a look The news continues here on ASEAN in Focus. We'll be right back. Alam namin ang iyong pagsisikap. Dama namin ang iyong mga sakripisyo. Kita namin ang pagharap mo sa bawat pagsubok. Kaya sa kabila ng mga hamon ng buhay, nandito kami para umalal. Ang morning show na always nagbibigay ng ngiti at saya sa bawat kada all over the world. Tara na at ma-inspire at ma-amaze sa kwento ng mga bawat kada na nagwagi sa anumang hamon at pagsubok ng buhay. Itago na mga remote control at tumambay lang dito sa paborito niyong barkata sa umaga ang Kada Umaga! Dahil kayo ang bida dito. Sumbong may responding katapat. Hindi nagdadalawang isip na tumulong. Sino man ang nangangailangan. CCTV footage sa panloob sa isang Korean store sa Quezon City. Eksklusibong napasakamay ng responde. Parangay at pulisya, ating kilalampag. Tatay na nasa likod ng viral na larawan na Natuloy pa rin ang pagkayod sa kabila ng kanyang katandaan, ating inayudahan. Isang grade 10 student na naghahanda na para sa araw ng kanyang moving up na sunugan. Kayang programa agad na rumisponde. Atampok sa ating e-responder. Grupo na tumutulong na mabigyan ng pangkabuhayan ng mga solo parents ating kilalanin. Kami ang Project Habina, Certified E-Responders. Mapapanood nyo kami sa mga sumusunod na mga channel. Sabado, alas 6 hanggang alas 7 ng gabi. Ito ang Responde, Mata na Mamamaya. Itutuwid na ba ni Maria Elena 
ang mga pagkakamali. Mama? Anong ginagawa mo rito? Ang mama mo ang nag-ayos ng paglaya ni Mr. Ivan. Anak, hindi man ako pabor sa relasyon niyo ni Angelito. Gusto ko na maging masaya ka. <laughs> Mabubuo na rin ba ang nooy pinaglayo? Gusto ko magkaayos na kami ng iyong mama. Oo, gusto ko nang kalimutan ng nakaraan at yung mga ginawa niya. Mga anak, dito na muna si Angelito kasama natin hanggang sa maging maayos ang lahat. Ayos yun! <laughs> Kailangan na kitang kalimutan. Magiging malaya na rin ako. <sighs> Minsan, nung birthday niya, gusto niyang ibili ko siya ng sapatos. Kaya halang mahal. Palabra de Amor Panalo tayo pag together Walang talo pag together Let's stand together Sa Net 25 The MOB Southeast Asia Cup o MSC 2020 Sino ang magwawagi at sino ang uuwing talunan? Which team will fly over the cloud at ibabad sa mga Kings of Sea? Ang MSC 2022 Arena ay tatanghal sa Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. From June 11 until June 19, follow Hashtag Supreme Sea for more updates. Mobile Legends Bang Bang, where heroes make history. In a related news, Russia's war in Ukraine has pushed global displacement numbers above 100 million for the first time, and the UN warns the resulting hunger crisis could force many more to flee their homes. Let's listen in. The figures remain, I think it's, it's worth repeating them because they are staggering. 89 million is the figure correct in the report related to 21 but even without U ukraine we were already on a very high figure unfortunately higher than the previous year and this trend has been going on now for several years certainly since i've taken this job every year there has been a higher displacement figure than the year before then of course as Junga mentioned already, we had Ukraine, and Ukraine has displaced um, anyway between 12 and 14 million people, depending on how you count them. So the figure has exceeded uh, 100 million. Uh, this, but I, unfortunately, I cannot imagine how, if you have a food crisis on top of everything that I have described, right? War, human rights, um, uh, climate, uh, you name it. On top of that, you have a food crisis. It will just accelerate the trends that are described in this report and that we have seen accelerating already in the first few months of the year. So definitely, um, what is being done to respond to the food insecurity crisis through funding um, and otherwise is of paramount importance also to prevent a larger number of people moving. If you ask me how many, that I don't know. But it could be pretty big numbers. In a related news at the Austrian World Summit Climate Conference, Arnold Schwarzenegger also denounced Europe for financing the war in Ukraine by paying Russia for fuel, saying, we have blood on our hands. Take a look. I mean, just look at the tragedy of Ukraine. We are all horrified by the images that we see in the news every night. But let's be honest, let's be honest with ourselves here. The 1,300 missiles that Russia launched into Ukraine cities during the first two months of the war cost 7.7 .7 billion euros. Now, that's a lot. But during that same time, Europe sent to Russia 44 billion euros for fuel. So, of course, the Russians are upset that they're losing all their soldiers and they're losing so many of the equipment and the tanks and the planes and all of this stuff, but they're saying, hey, at least we don't have to pay for this war. 
The Europeans are sending us the money. They're paying for the war. No matter how you look at it, we have blood on our hands because we are financing the war. We have to stop lying to ourselves. Right now, we have all the technology we need to leave fossil fuels in the past. We have a moral obligation to use this technology. We owe it to our millions of elders struggling to breathe around the world. We owe it to the Ukrainian children growing up in bomb shelters. We owe it to ourselves. Those of you joining us via the live stream, we welcome you all to the sixth. Meanwhile, President Xi Jinping assured Vladimir Putin of China's support on Russian sovereignty and security, leading Washington to warn Beijing it risked ending up on the wrong side of history. China has refused to condemn Moscow's massive military assault on Ukraine and has been accused of providing diplomatic cover for Russia by blasting Western sanctions and arms sales to Kiev. China is willing to continue to offer mutual support to Russia on issues concerning core interests and major concerns such as sovereignty and security, according to state broadcaster CCTV, reporting that she is saying, saying this during a call with President Putin. It was the second reported call between the two leaders since Putin launched his invasion of Ukraine on February 24. According to CCTV, C praised the good momentum of development in bilateral relations since the start of the year in the face of global turmoil and changes. Beijing was willing to intensify strategic coordination between the two countries, as C reported he said, and the Kremlin said the two leaders had agreed to ramp up economic cooperation in the face of unlawful Western sanctions. Meanwhile, millions of consumers and small businesses across Indonesia have been rattled by skyrocketing cooking, cooking oil prices following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Two major grain and sunflower seed producers. Take a look. Dari sekitar 30 bis yang 2 literan, ya. Jadi eh, semenjak gejolak minyak goreng mahal itu memang kita dampaknya harus pandai-pandai menghitung harga pokok produksi. Yang mau nggak mau konsumen harus menerima dengan kenaikan harga keripik tempe. Bahwa konsumen Indonesia tidak bisa dipisahkan dengan aktivitas goreng menggoreng ya artinya eh, dari sisi perilaku masa ya untuk kebutuhan domestik ataupun eh, apa keperluan seperti UMKM ya UKM dan UMKM memang aktivitas menggoreng itu cukup signifikan bagi <tuh> budaya atau habit dari masyarakat Indonesia sebuah kebijakan yang tadi saya bilang ekstrim tetapi pada konteks pelindungan konsumen itu di atas kertas bisa menurunkan harga dan saya lihat memang kemudian e, secara berangsur harga turun walaupun belum signifikan saya nggak tahu apakah ini memang e, polisi yang efektif untuk menurunkan pada hasil akhirnya atau memang as the war between the two major grain and sunflower seed producers sent jitters through global markets, many producers rushed to shift their goods abroad to cash in on soaring rates. Indonesia produces about 60% of global palm oil supplies, with one-third consumed domestically. India, China, the European Union, and Pakistan are among its major export or export customers. The squeeze on cooking oil at home forced the Indonesian government to impose a now-lifted ban on exports last month, easing prices and shoring up domestic supplies. Cooking oil prices were already on the rise in 2021, but the impact of Moscow's assault has driven them to record highs. 
Meanwhile, the Philippines' Russian or the Philippines' current stand on Russia-Ukraine war, as well as the Bank Samora development plan, are among the issues raised during President-elect Bongbong Marcos Jr.'s meetings with five envoys yesterday. Ambassador Jorn Janssen of Norway, Juha Marcos Peko of Finland, Titanelia Toth of Hungary, Raduta Dana Matashe of Romania, and uh, Bartina Tom Bizodwa Rabdebe Netshitisense of South Africa paid a courtesy call on uh, President-elect Marcos on his headquarters at his headquarters in Mandaluyong City. Take a look. And uh, we touched upon issues like economy, uh, human rights, the situation in the region in the Indo-Pacific, and finally, I express my gratitude to the President-elect for the contribution of the Filipino community and society in Finland. I mean, hardworking, friendly people who, who live and uh, work in my country, and it's highly appreciated. And we touch upon the needs for digitalization in uh, our societies, e-governance, but then in different fields of economy. I mean, health, education, for example. And on the Indo-Pacific, uh, we touched upon the current situation and I underlined the increasing interest of the European Union to strengthen uh, engagement here in the region. Finland is a member of the European Union and, and we uh, would be interested in increasingly working with the region and the Philippines on trade, sustainable development, uh, ocean governance, uh, human security, cyber security, maritime security. As an EU member state and Finland we want to work on upholding international law and uh, international rule-based order. And at this juncture I raise the Russian aggression against Ukraine because that's a severe breach of international law and international rule-based order. And you might know that Finland, we share a land border of uh, 1,300 kilometers with the Russian Federation. Russia is and will be our neighbor. But the Russian aggression was against Ukraine that has totally changed the security situation in my country and in the neighborhood there. To the Human Rights Council and Human Rights Chief Michel Bachelet, who's urged the international community to stand united in ending repression in Myanmar. Her comments came a day after she told member states that Myanmar's people were subject to likely crimes against humanity and war crimes and trapped in a cycle of poverty and displacement, human rights violations and abuses. Again, let's listen in. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. What we are witnessing today is the systematic and widespread use of tactics against civilians in respect of which there are reasonable grounds to believe the commission of crimes against humanity and war crimes. Since February 2021, at least 1,900 killings by the militaries have been reported. The humanitarian situation is dire. One million individuals have been registered by the UN as internally displaced, while some 14 million remain in urgent need of humanitarian assistance. Internet shutdowns imposed by the military across large parts of the country and the harassment and prosecution of journalists and individuals reporting on human rights has severely limited information flows and civic space. Despite the commitments made by the military to ASEAN, Senseless violence in Myanmar has intensified, with scant provision for, physics, for civilian protection or respect for international human rights and humanitarian laws by the military. Recent military operation in southeastern states of Kayin and Kaya, the northwestern state of Shin, and the central region of Sagain and Magwei have amplified the suffering of civilians. Local residents are often detained and in some cases may have been forcibly disappeared or used as human shield. A well-documented tactic of the military is the burning of entire villages, residential buildings, schools, houses of worship, and other objects specially protected under international humanitarian law. Some estimate over 1,000 uh, 11,000 sorry, such sites have been burned since the attempt coup began last year. Food stocks and other basic supplies have, been also, uh, have also been destroyed. This peaceful expression of dissent, however, are met with, with the continued use of arbitrary arrest and detention. 
Since the 1st of February 2021, more than 13,500 people, including politicians, media professionals, lawyers, civil society leaders, and other members of civil society, have reportedly been arrested for opposing Tan Madao's purported seizure of power. More than 10,500 remain in detention. I urgent call, urgently call on military authorities to refrain from such a regressive step, which would not only violate the right to life, but will further set back prospects for political reconciliation. Instead, the military has continued to use hostile and derogatory language to threaten and marginalize the Rohingya and to implement strict discriminatory limitations on their movement. In the past weeks, over 300 young Rohingya have been arrested for traveling what they call illegally outside their communities. Hundreds have been prosecuted and sentenced to prison terms up to two years for exercising their basic right to freedom of movement. I urge all member states, particularly those with the highest level access and influence, to intensify their pressure on the military leadership. Available measures include placing increased restrictions targeting military control, financial holdings, and business interests, and limiting their access to foreign currencies to restrict their ability to purchase military equipment and supplies. I also call for continued support to the efforts underway to pursue accountability for the ongoing and past serious human rights violations, as well as alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity through all available tracks. Myanmar's future depends on addressing the root causes of this crisis. Its people deserve a return to democracy, an end to impunity, and the immediate cessation of the systemic discrimination that has persecuted minorities, in particular the Rohingyas, for decades. They are counting on the Council's support. I thank you for your attention. Please. The European Union, the United Nations and the Australian government launched on Wednesday two projects to help former combatants in six Moro Islamic Liberation Front camps or MILF camps re-engage into civilian life. The projects will support Camp Bilal in Lanao provinces, Camp Bushra in Lanao del Sur, Camp Abu Bakar in Maguindanao, Camp Raja Muda in North Cotabato, Maguindanao, and Camps Badre and Omar in Maguindanao. According to the EU, a total of 301.51 million pesos from the bloc, the UN and Australia will be allocated for the programs. The alias DC, or the Access to Legal Identity and Social Services for Decommissioned Combatants, will provide 31,000 former MILF combatants, their families, the Bangsamoro Islamic Women's Brigade, and members of communities surrounding the camps with birth registration. The non-government organization Ideals will implement the project until 2023 with 62.41 million pesos funding from the EU and 18.1 million pesos from Australia. The Proactive R program on assistance for camp transformation through inclusion, violence prevention and economic empowerment, meanwhile will work help create uh, viable livelihoods in previously armed camps by supporting the formation of social enterprises offering individual agricultural and non-agricultural livelihood training and improving access to basic services and social infrastructure. EU Ambassador Luc Veron said the EU is here to support the work of the Bangsamoro Transitional, Transitional Government and the OPAPRU Office of uh, Presidential Advisor of Peace, Reconciliation and Unity Office of Presidential Advisor of Peace, Reconciliation to consolidate peace, the peace process. Now, Australian Ambassador to the Philippines Stephen J. Robinson said Australia has been a longtime supporter of the peace process in Mindanao. In his message, UN Resident Coordinator to the Philippines Gustavo Gonzalez, meanwhile, said peace and development must walk hand in hand. The Philippines Consul General and members of the Filipino community in Guam paid a visit to the missile frigate 
BRP Antonio Luna or FF-151 while the ship was refueling and reprovisioning at the naval base Guam last June 14. Consul General Patrick John Hilado, the Consulate General of the Philippines in Guam, along with members of the Filipino community, came aboard the Philippine Navy frigate BRP Antonio Luna on June 14, according to Philippine Navy spokesperson Commander Benjo Negranza in a statement on Wednesday night. The ship is currently docked at the U-2 Pier of Naval Base Guam for a short layover in preparation for its voyage to Hawaii for the Rim of the Pacific or Rim Pack exercise, which is scheduled from June 29 to August 4. The BRP Antonio Luna stopover in Guam is intended for the replenishment in preparation for its voyage to Hawaii, where it will participate in RIMPAC 2022, the world's largest naval exercise. RIMPAC is held by Yinyali to promote regional stability in the Pacific region. Around 25,000 personnel from 26 participating nations are set to join the 28th iteration of RIMPAC, which was first conducted in 1971. Negranza earlier said NTG 80.5 will help develop, maintain, and enhance the Navy's pursuit of maritime collaboration with its counterparts through the exercise. The decades-old alliance and people-to-people -people ties between the Philippines and the United States have remained strong over the past 75 years despite differences. This is the message of the Philippines Matters for America, America Matters for the Philippines publication launched at the U.S. Embassy in Manila on June 15, which capped off the year-long celebration of the 75th anniversary of the Philippines and the U.S. diplomatic relations. Take a look. For presenting to our various publics in easily comprehensible snapshots the breadth and depth of our bilateral relationship. Published by the East-West Center, the publication sums up important aspects of the two countries' bilateral relations, including security, trade, and investments, health and environment, development assistance, culture, and people-to-people -people ties, among others. According to the publication, security relations between the two remain strong, with the Philippines continuing to be the U.S. oldest ally in the Indo-Pacific. Given the changing geopolitical climate in the region, however, East-West Center Director Sato Limaya said Manila and Washington, D.C. should continue to look at opportunities to strengthen this alliance. This, he said, can include the 2 plus 2 process to look at the strategic elements in the relationships as well as contingency plans that might be required to protect our prospective security, including in the South. China Sea. India is hosting the Special Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN India Foreign Ministers meeting in New Delhi, India. This is from June 16 to the 17th. The event marks the 30th anniversary of the ASEAN-India ties and 10th year strategic partnership with ASEAN member states. Initiatives to sustain economic recovery amid the COVID pandemic and further strengthening partner partnerships among ASEAN countries will be part of the discussions during the special meeting. External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jai Shankar and His Excellency Mr. Vivian Balakrishnan uh, Foreign Minister of Singapore, India's country coordinator, will co-chair the meeting. The foreign ministers, along with business leaders, scholars, and academicians, will also participate in the 12th edition of the Delhi Dialogue themed Breaking Barriers, Building Bridges in the Indo-Pacific. In commemoration of the ASEAN-India Friendship Year 2022, discussing efforts to further boost the Southeast Asian members' strategic partnerships. As the chair of ASEAN Health Ministers Meeting, or AHMM, Indonesia hosted the 15th AHMM and related meetings from May 11 to the 15th in Bali, Indonesia, through a hybrid meeting format. Let's take a look. In the 14th ASEAN Health Ministers Meeting in 2019 in Siem Reap, Cambodia, Indonesia has presented the theme for our chairmanship 2020-2022 entitled Advancing the Achievement of ASEAN Health Development. Through this theme, Indonesia will strengthen ASEAN Health Cooperation by setting course for the next five years policy and its work program 2021-2025.
Under Indonesia's chairmanship, the ASEAN Health Sector has successfully developed the ASEAN Post 2015 Health Development Agenda 2021-2025 that showcases the alignment among its strategic elements and they are vision, mission, goals, strategies, objectives, key performance targets, health priorities, and project activities. This document has considered and addressed current issues highlighting COVID-19 pandemic preparedness and response, digital health and health information system, and human resources for health. In early 2020, many if not all countries in the world, including ASEAN member states, were challenged by an unprecedented situation of the COVID-19 pandemic. In response to this, as the chair of the AHMM, Indonesia took the lead for a collective response to synergize and scale up ASEAN health mechanisms and platforms in a coherent ASEAN way, such as ASEAN Emergency Operations Center, ASEAN Plus Free Field Epidemiology Training Network, ASEAN Biodiaspora Virtual Center, ASEAN Vaccine Security and Self-Reliance, and Regional Collaborative Strategy on ASEAN Drug Security and Self-Reliance. These mechanisms and platforms enable the ASEAN health sector to address gaps and improve the ASEAN member states' health system by conducting rapid information sharing and technical exchanges, risk assessment, risk communication, contact tracing, exchange of laboratory readiness and response action, and capacity strengthening. As the health sector continues to respond according to the evolutions of the outbreaks in ASEAN, the health ministers convene a special video conference among ASEAN health ministers and with Plus 3 and also with the United States to review current situations and also response, outline priority policy and strategic directions. ASEAN health sector is aware that global crises require global cooperation. In light of this, we enhance our engagement with external and development partners which deliver several initiatives to strengthen current response and ensure future preparedness. In view of these considerations, we are establishing new initiatives to form ASEAN's comprehensive approach in responding to public health emergencies and other future emerging and re-emerging infectious disease threats, such as for public health emergencies that guide ASEAN cooperation in enhancing regional preparedness, detection, response, and resilience to public health emergencies. Under Indonesia's chairmanship, the ASEAN health sector has been working closely in enhancing cooperation and addressing prioritized health issues and concern in ASEAN and contributes in strengthening global health architecture, while also adapting to recent development, requiring ASEAN health sector cooperation to be flexible in its practices. ASEAN Health Sector will continue to move forward and become more resilient, preventive, responsive, adaptive for its next phase of regional cooperation. And today's other news, Metro Manila will remain under the most lenient alert level 1 until the end of the month, June 30, according to Malacanang announcing this yesterday. And this after the Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases approved the new alert level classifications in the country, according to Acting Presidential Spokesperson and Communications Secretary Martin Andanar. In a press statement, Andanar said the municipality of Pateros and the cities of Caloocan, Malabon, Navotas, Valenzuela, Pasig, Marikina, Quezon, Manila, Makati, Mandaluyong, San Juan, Montilupa, Paranaque, Las Piñas, and Pasay in the National Capital Region will be under alert level 1 from June 16 to the 30th. The IATF EID's latest decision came after Health Undersecretary Maria Rosario Vergere earlier raised the possibility of upgrading the alert level status in Metro Manila because of the apparent uptick in COVID-19 infections in the country's metropolis. The World Health Organization said it would hold an emergency meeting next week to determine whether to classify the global 
monkeypox outbreak as a public health emergency of international concern. The UN agency is also working to change the name of the disease, which was long confined to Western and Central Africa until more than a thousand cases were detected in dozens of countries across the world over the last two months. Let's listen in. The global outbreak of monkeypox is clearly unusual and concerning. It's for that reason that I have decided to convene the emergency committee under the international health regulations next week to assess whether this outbreak represents a public health emergency of international concern. I think it, it's now clear that there is um, an unusual uh, uh, situation, meaning even the virus is, is, is behaving unusually from how uh, it used to behave in, 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 in the past. Uh, but not only that, it's also affecting more and, and, and more countries. We believe uh, that it needs um, also some coordinated response because of the ge geographic uh, spread. Uh, plus, at the same time, having an executive committee would help us uh, to discuss about this issue. These are uh, experts, external experts. Uh, to understand the virus uh, better. And on today's ASEAN Dengue Day, let's unite to fight against dengue. Themed ASEAN's resilience against dengue amidst COVID-19 pandemic, ASEAN encourages all member states to work together as a community to document and share our adaptive measures to prevent, control dengue outbreaks. Dengue is a mosquito-borne viral disease that has rapidly spread in most ASEAN countries in recent years. The virus is transmitted by female mosquitoes, mainly of the species Aedes aegypti. Dengue is widespread throughout ASEAN with local variations in risk influenced by climate parameters as well as social and environmental factors. Dengue affected several ASEAN countries with report of increasing in the number of cases in Cambodia in 2019 and then in Indonesia, Singapore and Thailand in 2020 while continually affecting other ASEAN countries like Vietnam and the Philippines. Finally, in our news, BTS fans in Malaysia were shocked when the group announced that they would be taking a hiatus to focus on solo projects. They also cited uh, exhaustion and the pressures of uh, success in an emotional video appearance. Let's look at some reactions. I'm very proud of them. They are like, they have no idea how, how many people actually love them a lot. Like. They deserve the love a lot and we will wait for them lah, no matter how long it takes. I was totally surprised actually that uh, they, they, um, they are actually uh, you know, not continuing their concert. I was expecting them at least this year to, to, to do a few more concerts before they, they go for their military uh, service. But at the same time, I'm happy for them if, um, if, if what they are planning to do is good for their individual development. I wish you all the best and I, I pray that you all will come back um, in full force, well rested and um, I'm really really looking forward to see your concert very 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 soon. First introduced to BTS by their music and their, their music is always so fun and so touching for me. Like they, like others say, they always help me. It really helped me that uh, I can, I can feel how, how, how they want to uh, give us the message of love from their songs. Very shocked about this news, but we are like, really relieved about their decision because they have been like 
doing their work since 2013, since their debut, so it's almost 10 years. So we are quite actually with their decision for this time because I think uh, they deserve to for this break. 언젠가부터인가 모르겠어. 나도 우리 팀이 뭔지 앞으로 어떻게 해야 될지 전혀 모르겠다라는 게 컸어요. 저는 나는. 근데 문제는 이, 이 어쨌든 K-pop이라는 것도 그렇고 이 어쨌든 시, 아이돌이라는 시스템 자체가 사람을 숙성하게 놔두지 않는 것 같아요. 아니 제일 어려운 게 가사 쓰는 거야. 그러니까 할 말이 있어. 안 나와 그러니까. 그러니까 억지로 할 말이 없어 진짜. 그러니까 내가 느끼고 내가 이야기하고 싶은 걸 이야기를 해야 되는데 그러니까 억지로 쥐어 짜내고 있는 건 거야 그냥 계속. 어쨌든 누군가를 만족시켜주고 누군가를 누군가가 이걸 들어줘야 되니까 그러니까 그게 너무 괴로운데 각자의 어떠한 가수로 팬분들한테 남고 싶다는 생각을 이제 하게 돼서 지금 좀 힘든 시간을 겪고 있는 것 같아요 이제 정체성을 이제서야 더 찾아가려고 하는 시기인 것 같고 저희도 뭔가 개인적으로 이제 각자 시간 가지면서 또 좋은 시간도 많이 보내고 또 다양한 경험들 쌓아오면서 또한 단계 더 성장해 저 성장을 해서 여러분들 앞에 돌아온 날이 분명도 있을 거고 그래가지고 각자 삶을 위해서 우리를 위해서 한번 짠 올려보도록 하겠습니다. <웃음> <웃음> Now, they have been called uh, icons of progressive globalism and have been said to embody the 21st century zeitgeist, but at heart, they're just entertainers. The Grammy-nominated Septet are the first all-South Korean act to dominate the U.S. and U.K. charts, raking in billions of dollars and building a global fandom known as ARMY in the process. Their embrace of social media meant they barely missed a beat during the pandemic, using direct engagement with fans online to cement their position as the world's biggest and most influential boy band. Some experts have blamed South Korea's mandatory military service for the septet's break. All South Korean able-bodied young men under 30 must perform around two years of military service, largely thanks to nuclear-armed North Korea, with whom the South remains technically at war. Local media say the break may take as long as seven years if the septet decides to wait until all members to complete their military duties. And that's it for today's broadcast of ASEAN in Focus. We'll see you back tomorrow. Same time, same place. I'm Alma Angeles. Thank you for joining us.